Sound okay. good? Welcome again to another episode of Adam's Corner. Today, I'm joined by not only a guest, but a good friend, Mr. Noel Thomas Manning. <laughs> He's uh, We've done a lot of things together over the years, and he is just um, a, a really good wealth of information, a good friend to have, and uh, we always enjoy bantering it up on his show. And so today, we are having him on to talk about somebody that is very important to the North Carolina film scene, I would say, and that's Earl Owensby, who did something really unique in the 1970s, and we'll get to that here in just a bit. Uh, but Earl Owensby basically was the first independent filmmaker, I guess you would say the, the best way to put it, uh, to do something of that nature in North Carolina. But uh, he's, he's a legend around these parts, and uh, again, like I said, we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, furthermore, you made a documentary in 1997, I think was the release date on that, about Earl and his career. And you can see in the video here, the video version, The Man, The Myth, Earl Owensby. And uh, so uh, before we get into his actual, the nuts and bolts of his career, I just thought I would ask you how you got to know him first. Uh, I was just curious about that, how you connected with him. Adam, first, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me on your show. It's always good spending time with you, and I uh, appreciate you inviting me to, to be a part of this to celebrate uh, Earl, uh, who uh, officially launched his uh, career uh, uh, in filmmaking. Come on, Earl Owensby, uh, kind of a North Carolina pioneer, a legendary pioneer for filmmaking. Uh, in uh, 1973, it was November 10th, 1973 was when he started making his very first film called Challenge. And uh, we'll, I know we're going to be covering some of that, but I'm just happy to be here as we talk about that and celebrate that. Uh, the way I met Earl Owensby was uh, I was working for uh, Shelby Headline News, which was a headline news affiliate uh, back in the 90s. And uh, in 1993, it was the uh, celebration of Earl's 20th uh, anniversary uh, of starting uh, the studio. And it was my job uh, to go and uh, set up an interview and uh, and meet him. And that was the first time I'd ever met him. I'd heard of Earl for years, a really good friend of mine uh, growing up, grew up in Shelby. And so the, the first time I'd heard Earl's name was uh, when he was uh, uh, filming and working on the film called Rottweiler, uh, Dogs from Hell. And, and the, the catchphrase from that was Jaws with Paws. And... Uh, <laughs> But a friend of mine was telling me about how 60 Minutes, CBS's 60 Minutes had come to Shelby to do this feature on Earl Owensby, this North Carolina filmmaker. And I'd never heard of Earl until that time. And so that was my first introduction. And, you know, hearing the stories from, uh, from my friends named Jack Lewis, who grew up here in, in Shelby, and hearing those Earl stories from here really intrigued me. And so when I got a chance to move to this area uh, in, the, uh, in the late 80s, uh, to go to Gardner Webb University, uh, continued to hear about Earl and met people who knew Earl, but it was 1993 was that first time I got a chance to, to meet him. And, and I remember picking up the phone to call and schedule an appointment uh, to see if I could get this interview. He picked up the phone. I'm like, okay, I'm calling this movie studio and, and the, you know, the guy himself is picking up the phone. <laughs> and that just really, you know, really surprised me. And uh, I told him who I was, introduced myself, and said, so I'd love to interview you uh, about your you know, about your film career. He invited me over, and we spent an hour on that first meeting uh, just talking about his entire kind of film legacy at that time. And from from that point on, we, we became kind of fast friends. We, we really clicked. Uh, there was chemistry there from a standpoint of just a friendship that developed. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, uh, I, I wanted to kind of expand that research and the interviews I did um, in 93 and take it a step further. And that's where the documentary came out, uh, Earl Owensby, The Man, The Myth. And I got to interview a lot of, uh, a lot of those who had worked with him over the years. And uh, the North Carolina Film Commissioner interviewed him at that time and interviewed Earl's ex-wives. That was some fun stuff there, I got to tell you. <laughs> isn't it always? Isn't it always? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I um, I first became aware of Earl. My dad was a social worker in uh, Gaston County, which is not far from Cleveland County, where the studios are based. 
And a lot of the people that my dad worked with that were in his Gaston County Social Services, they, on the side, they were involved in the uh, theater stuff, uh, you know, the, the um, local theater, I guess you would say. And a lot of these people, Earl had, somehow or another, he was connected to a lot of the people in the Gaston County theater scene, and he cast a lot of these people in his films. So my dad knew these people, they were friends of his that had been in Earl's films, and he would come home and uh, tell, talk about this friend was in Earl's film, and that friend was in Earl's film, and then uh, occasionally we would go to uh, like a Christmas or a Halloween party at, one, at these people's houses that my dad would bring me along as a kid, and so I would... I would go along with him, and they would talk about Earl. So it was, he was in the conversation. And then I remember the first Earl Owensby film I actually saw was in a theater in 1979. Uh, our local theater in Lincolnton, where I grew up, they were running Wolfman when it first came out. And so I was a big monster kid growing up. That was a big thing for me. And I got my mom to take me to see Wolfman. And so, yep, there it is. There it is, right there. And I have not seen it in 44 years. I've got to tell you, I have not <laughs> wow. seen it. And I need to go back and rewatch. But my mother took me to see it, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, you know, I might feel differently now as we get older. You can see, but you know, when you're nine years old, or I guess maybe I was eight around the time I was th in third grade, I really enjoyed it. And it wasn't long after that that our local ABC affiliate, uh, WSOC here, uh, they would run on Saturday afternoons just films that they had, I guess, in their syndication package, and Challenge turned up on a Saturday afternoon. And so my dad and I watched that together. I was obviously too young to have seen Death Wish, and it's obviously a somewhat of a reworking of Death Wish, because that's what Earl would do. And we'll, and we'll, uh, we, we can talk about what he would do in terms of the ch projects he chose. He would kind of find a trend that was successful and, and do his own version of it. And you can talk a little bit about that. But I, I was just, I thought we could talk a little bit also about uh, the origins of Earl's studio, uh, where he got the financing, the funding to do what, you know, it's, it's kind of definitely unique, not kind of definitely unique, uh, what he managed to do uh, in, you know, rural North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you talk to Earl about uh, the, the big question of why did you choose this area in, instead of, you know, trying to do it in Hollywood, and he said, you know, because this is where I live. I mean, that's his answer. This is where I lived. This was my home. Uh, I, I knew that you could do it. It was a it was a business. You could turn it into a factory, basically a movie factory. That was his concept. And he said from the beginning, he never set out to just make one movie. He wanted to create a movie studio. That was his goal from from the start. And the way he got the idea uh, was he uh, saw the movie um, Walking Tall was a big fan of that movie, he liked Billy Jack, he liked the, those kinds of films. But Walking Tall was filmed in McMinnville, Tennessee, and it was it was done on a very low budget, and it, it made quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And so Earl was thinking, well, hey, if they can do that in Tennessee, well, you know, Shelby, North Carolina, is not that far removed from McMinnville, Tennessee. And so that's where he kind of got the idea. He had been a very successful a businessman on the outside, uh, industrial tools, and um, had found a way to make money. And, and Earl truly was a salesman uh, at heart and in mind and still is. I mean, when you look at the marketing of what he did, it was Earl. Uh, I mean, the, the fact that 60 Minutes spent time coming to Shelby, North Carolina for a, a, a week or so, interviewing uh, Earl and following him around uh, the, the set and, and being a part of this community, to learn about it was just incredibly fascinating, and you can't imagine something like that happening. Uh, 60 Minutes at that time was, you know, the place to go for kind of that long-form news. And uh, when when that episode aired, that particular episode that featured Earl, uh, it was it was on the very same night as the Super Bowl. So that particular uh, audience for that, and remember at that time, 82. You know, you, cable was starting out, but not everybody had cable. Uh, so that the networks, the networks reigned still. And so that particular uh, episode of 60 Minutes that featured Earl was one of the highest watched that entire year. And, and, and Earl would say, yeah, because it was B. He's like, okay, it was because it was the Super Bowl, but you know, <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of credit. But, uh, but Earl, you know, he, he had money. 
uh, and he found investors. He found people who were willing to uh, to invest in something that was different, that was unique, and that was uh, that was new for this particular area. And you know, pioneering filmmaking in North Carolina. You got to remember, you know, now when we think about North Carolina filmmaking, a lot of people think about Wilmington and think about that portion of it, but that only happened because of Earl and Earl uh, and Dino De Laurentiis came together and they were going to film a movie called Firestarter yeah. here. Uh, and they actually had, they were going to use Earl's studios. And uh, there was a little bit of a, a disagreement. And, you know, you're talking to some of the people behind the scenes. <laughs> they, they, they say, you know, Earl's talking uh, his, um, his Southern cliffside and you've got, Dino talking his, you know, his Italian and that, you know, you can't understand either one of them where they're going at each other. And and so finally, that movie ended up, um, Firestarter ended up uh, being the start of creating this studio in Wilmington, North Carolina, that would have never happened had Earl not proved that you could make money and you could do it here uh, in North Carolina. And others continued to follow. And it was amazing, you know, 20th Century Fox came, uh, they they filmed a, um, they had a, a few films. One of those was called Ruben Ruben with Tom Conti, and uh, and that got some love. Kelly McGillis uh, in that uh, as well. That was shot in Shelby and uh, produced uh, through Earl's Studios. Even though it was a 20th Century Fox production, Earl was connected to it. And there were several of those that would lease out the studios because they knew, hey, you, you got it, you got something here. Now I'm gonna go back to Firestarter real quickly. Um, uh, uh, there were a lot of folks who had been cast, you're talking about those theater people. Uh, Earl did love to cast people who were in uh, community theaters, whether it was Charlotte, Gastonia, even in Shelby, for his projects. And uh, and even those that were, uh, were TV personalities like Larry Sprinkle and Mike McKay, you know, they would show up uh, in Earl's films because they had voices, they had presence, they knew what to do in front of a camera. And, uh, and many of those that were cast initially in Firestarter and even some of the crew that were going to be working with Earl when it was coming through Earl's, once Dino took it, they went and followed Dino. And ultimately, that became kind of the, um, the launching point for many of these careers that they ended up going and working uh, in Hollywood circles. It's, it's a really fascinating story. And, and it's, it's one of those that it would be a fascinating movie uh, when you really think about all that happened and how it happened and, and all the odds that were stacked against it actually finding success. Yeah, that's true. And, and he came along at a, at a time when that sort of thing could be done. He, he, you know, there's timing is definitely an element in anybody's success. And he, he came along at a time when the drive-in movie, there was a market for specific types of films that were shown in drive-ins. And his product fit the bill for what was demanded of, of drive-in in, in drive-in theaters and that was a to me it's a magical time that it's long gone and will never come again and you know there's still drive-ins around but they just show the normal programmers that you get in walk-in theaters there were specific types of films you know exploitation is one genre that you would find and his his kind of sort of borderline on exploitation i i guess you would say although he was always careful to point out no adult language in my films, you know. <laughs> there may be yeah. quite a bit of violence, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you you wouldn't find the you wouldn't find uh language, you wouldn't find uh nudity. sex scenes, nudity, right. you wouldn't find that. I mean, um uh, there were uh, several producers that uh tried to come to his studios to get him to to shoot X-rated films, mm -hmm. adult films at the time. And he was like, "No, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it." Yeah, that's true. Yeah, all the and, films were PG rated, I believe. From, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, most of them PG. Now there were a few that um, ended up being released under like the unrated because Dark Sunday was one of those that had so much violence mm -hmm. that uh, the uh, Motion Picture Association of America at that time MPAA uh, decided to give it an X rating for violence, and right. so uh, Earl ended up taking uh, taking the MPAA to court. Uh, and basically argued that, hey, you know, if you compare mine to a, a Clint Eastwood film of, of the same type, you know, talk about comparisons, you, you look at the bullet hits, you look at the deaths, 
here in this Eastwood film, which is a studio product, and then you look at mine, compare the two, and the violence is the same, and yet you're you're going after the independents. And so basically, you know, he kind of proved his point, uh, and they were they were going to give it an R rating, and so he decided, and he actually argued. Here's the funny thing: he argued for a G rating. <laughs> <laughs> on principle, he did it on principle. He argued yeah. for a G rating, and they and they ended up uh, saying, "Okay, we'll release it. We'll give it an R rating." And so he decided, "Now I'm going to release it with a with a basically um, unrated." Uh, and he did that with with a um, with that film. And then there was another slasher film that was shot uh, through uh, alums or, or by alums uh, from the Earl Owensby uh, School of Filmmaking, I like to call it, and it was called Final Exam. Uh, and that one also went through the same kind of process that they were going to slap an X rating on it because of, of violence. And so they ended up um, taking out some of the scenes where you, instead of seeing the close-ups of the, the, the slasher, you know, going into somebody's chest with a sickle or whatever, um, they would show you know, the sickle coming down, but then they would cut to the aftermath of it. And so they ended up going, I think, from 18 deaths to 12 that you could see, and that got them, you know, a better a better rating. But yeah, it, it is fascinating. And you talked about the drive-in theaters at that time. Uh, there were a lot of these kind of action, adventure, um, exploitation type films uh, or X-rated films. That's what the drive-ins were doing uh, during the the 70s and, and even into the the early uh, early 80s. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he, like I said, the timing was perfect for him in what he did. And that's, you know, and so uh, there was, and, and then later on the video era came along. And of course that changed things. The drive-in circuit was, you know, still around, as I said, but the, the types of films that were unique to drive-ins were not, unfortunately. Yep. And so, like I said, it was a, uh, it was, a, it was a real unique time that he chose to embark on this, uh, career path and, and so yeah and we'll talk we can talk about some of the actual titles in his filmography there there's definitely there are definitely some interesting ones we can just um i would say the height of his success probably was the around the late 70s maybe early 80s i would say that in terms of uh the financial returns that he was getting i mean uh, he was mostly a producer not not a lot of actual directing just mostly producing the films that he did but you know we talked about challenge obviously uh is one of them and then there was a, you talked about dark sunday uh, there's death driver uh wolfman we've spoken about and then living legend which is kind of a quasi reworking of the elvis presley story <laughs> and we can discuss that one my dad wanted to see that one really really badly and it we it just didn't play around here that i'm aware of or not not in theaters in my in in lincoln and i don't remember you know I've, i know it played um you know in places around the country but i interestingly enough not here and so it was only when it appeared on youtube that i was able to get my dad a copy of it and he finally got to see it and there were quite a few of his office mates that appeared there so in, in that one so uh, and the, but i guess it was ginger alden who was a, an actual girlfriend of elvis's who appears in the film. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it was based on uh, on the life and struggles of, of Elvis. I mean, if you watch it, even though the the, the character's name is Eli Canfield, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, you, can't, you can't help but look at it and know, okay, this is based on Elvis. So many aspects of, of the life of Elvis. And if you watched the Elvis film that came out, uh, you know, recently that got a lot of awards love, uh, back in, uh, what's that, 2022, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you look at Living Legend, you're like, wow, okay, there's some incredible similarities, some truths there. And one of the things that, that I loved about a Living Legend is uh, Earl was able to uh, recruit Roy Orbison to record the soundtrack, an original soundtrack uh, for this film, and that's fascinating in itself. You know, at that yeah. time, uh, Roy was kind of uh, in between his popularity before he, he kind of uh, relaunched his career uh, and went with the Traveling Wilburys and had that incredible uh, concert uh, documentary, uh, I think Roy Orbison and Black and White, a uh, Black and White Night um, that had a lot of guests on that. But this was kind of in between. And so it was a, a chance for Roy to do something new and do something different. And Roy lived uh, here in, in Shelby during the filming of this. And uh, I was speaking to Worth Keeter uh, recently, Worth Keeter was the director 
-hmm. for this particular film for uh, for Living Legend, and he talked about how uh, Roy would kind of be in the studio and they would be recording audio stuff, and then they would send Worth the you know the the audio takes on on reel, and then he would have to try to put those things together and try to figure out okay now we've got to have this in a way that we can shoot it and and let Earl because Earl played the title character lip sync to this, but when he was uh, piecing the stuff together, he was like, wait, this doesn't quite sound like like Roy Orbison's voice. And it was because it didn't have that reverb that we all know when mm -hmm. we think about Roy Orbison now. There's this very specific reverb that when you listen to his songs, there's something very distinctive yeah. about not just the voice, not just the incredible voice, mm -hmm. but that little delay as well. Um, and, you know, this film, uh, you know, they had... You know, concert uh, concert shots that were recreated in the, the one of the old Charlotte Coliseums. They used Malcolm Brown Auditorium in Shelby, uh, and and you know, talking to Earl was just a fascinating story to tell because it was a drama. It was kind of a departure from the action, uh, you know, revenge pictures mm -hmm. that he had typically been a part of before. So, Living Legend was definitely one of those that found success and. Uh, the soundtrack actually got some love. I think it was the Academy of, of Country Music uh, or one of the country music associations was uh, nominated it for uh, soundtrack of the year that year. And and, uh, and Earl said it lost out to, to, you know, a Willie Nelson film. So he said, Willie did it to me. Willie did it to me. Yeah, that would have probably been Honeysuckle Rose, I guess. It might have been. I think it was because that was the same year. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I had forgotten about that because the previous year w was the Elvis film with Kurt Russell directed by John Carpenter, and Ronnie McDowell had done the uh, the, the singing for that one. So I, I couldn't remember if Ronnie McDowell stepped over to this one. But, yeah, you just jogged my memory. I, I had forgotten. But, yeah, yeah, you're right. This was before um, I think I read Roy's biography years ago, and it said that he had been reduced to playing state fairs at this yeah. point in his career, which was Kind of a big come down. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the uh, Ginger Alden, Earl Owensby, living legend. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know it, it, it's an interesting curio, uh, uh, you know, and uh, to you know the his idea of uh, re redoing the life of Elvis, as it were, I guess. And so, yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's something I would say worth seeking out. Now, I did see. I must say, now Day of Judgment is interesting because. A couple of years ago, Arrow Video actually released a Blu-ray of that. So that's out in a special edition Blu-ray with all kinds of bells and whistles. And it I have a copy of it. It really is its a good transfer uh, as far as these things go. I had not seen it. I think Larry Sprinkle's in that. That is one of the ones that he appears in because I remember I think he's a, a, vict a murder victim at some point in the, in the film, I believe. He's dispatched. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting that Arrow, they do a lot of these cult horror films, and I was really shocked and surprised to see that one. So I have to, if anybody really wants a, a good copy of it, it's, it's out there um, as well. And Dogs of Hell I did see in a theater as well, by the way. I, um, I saw that around, I guess it was 1995. There was a theater up in Hickory owned by United Artists Cinemas. There we go. Rottweiler. Hound of Hell, dog, dog, <laughs> dogs of Hell, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah many, many different titles. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say that's a fascinating thing. Is what Earl would do is he would release a film under a, a certain title, and then you know a few years later re-release it under mm -hmm. a di different title. Rottweiler was one of those that was initially released as Rottweiler, uh, and then. Um, I think it was actually uh, in the overseas market, and that's where Earl found his. his major success was the overseas market uh they you know they they didn't really have a um a, a, a term for translating rottweiler other than rottweiler and so they they would call it dogs from hell in in that <laughs> literal translation yeah. and so earl was like hey that's a that's a good idea and uh it, it if you want to look at some of earl's dubs uh in other countries there, he's got some trailers out there on youtube and there's a great one for challenge uh, that I that I recently just came across and it would just crack me up because back when I did the uh, documentary The Man the Myth back in '97 I I didn't have access to a lot of these things and so mm -hmm. what I would do what I ended up doing was recreating some of those by getting Gardner Webb University students 
to come in and into the studio and actually dub voices. And so I got all of these international <laughs> students to do to do to do voices as if it were released in other countries. And now I'm able to actually find some of those, and it's just fascinating. But yeah, Earl would change the name of, of some of his films to get you know some more play on it. And sometimes it would happen um, because of the international market. Uh, you were asking about successful films. Uh, Earl would say that Rutherford County Line, which was based on a true story of Damon Husky, who was a sheriff uh, who um, lost his uh, brother um, and, and others that were killed from someone who were, they were in law enforcement, they were killed. And it's kind of that Damon Husky story based on a true story, based on court transcripts. Uh, the original movie was called Rutherford County Line, but it was re-released later uh, under the name Damon's Law. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so Earl w was just fascinating. Uh, you know, early on, he would do these films that were kind of copies of films that he appreciated, things he loved. I mean, there was, you talk about challenge, that if you look at uh, Billy Jack and if you look at Walking Tall, there's so many similarities there. But then he would start um, working with the, the screenwriters to say, hey, I've got this idea, I want to base it on some real life situations. And, and that's where uh, Living Legend and Rutherford County Line both kind of came from real life situations. And, and Earl, uh, his last film that he acted in was Rutherford County Line. And he said that after he did that, uh, he felt like he had done it because uh, when he was initially uh, working on Challenge, he wanted to hire David Jansen. Uh, you know, David Jansen from the, from the Fugitive fame and, and David Jansen's uh, asking price was about half the budget of the film. <laughs> and Earl, Earl said, I'll do it. I'll do it. How hard can it be to act? And so it's just, all acting is, is reacting. And so <laughs> he, he learned, and if you look at uh, his acting and challenge and then compare it to what he did in Rutherford County Line, you can see this, this growth mm -hmm. um, yeah. of his acting talent. And... You know, he, he, he would tell you, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not an Oscar winner. I never went out to be an Oscar winner. I just, I wanted to be a movie star. Make movies, star in movies, make them, make some money. And, and that's kind of what he did. But Rutherford County Line was the one where he said, okay, you know what? I'm not going to act anymore. I'll produce uh, and, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll step back and do that part of it, but I don't want to act anymore. And uh, that was just, that's kind of a fascinating story in itself when people said, Okay, why did he stop acting? Well, he stopped acting because he felt like he had achieved what he wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and, and you know, while we're on the subject of his later films, I think it's worth mentioning that he actually attempted to branch out into concert films with, uh, and I am a huge fan of Brother Dave Gardner. My dad had the comedy albums. Uh, he was hugely successful around the same time Bill Cosby and Bob Newhart and a lot of those comics were getting albums that were frequently hitting the number one spot on the Billboard albums charts, which is, you know, it's amazing to think about comedy albums in this day and age getting to number one, and yet there was a there was a trend there. I think The First Family is another one, uh, which was a parody of, you know, the, the, the Kennedy administration, and so there was a whole slew of these comedy albums, and Brother Dave was one of those, I think, uh, his, his album... Uh, I think it was Rejoice Dear Hearts got the number two, I believe, on the album, on Billboard album charts. And he actually got a charting single that was uh, culled from that album, I believe, uh, his version of uh, 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 White Silver Sands, I believe it was. So anyway, the point is that by the time the 70s had rolled around and his career was kind of in a slump as well, and so Earl had this idea that let's let's get Brother Dave to do these routines that he was beloved for in the 60s while he's still around and he got him at the right time because he subsequently appeared in one of Earl's films Chain Gang I believe and had a heart attack while they were shooting the film and he died right so the fact that he was able to and I believe it was shot in Myrtle Beach I believe so you can correct me on any of this that I'm wrong about but uh, that I think it's on YouTube but uh, Brother Dave live and in concert and I am just a huge huge Brother Dave fan so I think it's great that you know that this is there. Uh, th of course, it's the later stage of Brother Dave's career, so the freshness isn't quite there with the actual So he, You feel like he's rushing the routines a little bit at times, but it's still great to just have Brother Dave doing them. 
And of course, Brother Dave would probably be considered politically incorrect today. And we, you know, there's he would be run out of town most likely <laughs> for various reasons. And Ray Stevens stole a lot from Brother Dave because if you listen to the Brother Dave albums and listen to the Ray Stevens comedy recordings of the early 60s, especially like Santa Claus is watching you. Uh, there's a lot of the voices that he's directly lifting from the Brother Dave albums. And so, you know, I, I think these figures that, that Earl was appreciative of, and like myself, he felt the same way I did. Hey, this Brother Dave's, uh, you know, he's, he's a real gem. Let's get him while he's still around. And so I, I just think, I just want to mention that, that he did, that he did a concert film, which is, uh, and it's great that he did, because he's been gone now almost 40 years, uh, Brother Dave. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Earl. I think there were two two things about Earl that that I find found and continue to find fascinating is that uh, he would look at these that uh, these talents, whether they were acting talents or whether they were people behind the scenes that didn't really have uh, a lot of experience and and want to give them opportunities in, in whatever fields they wanted to go into. Uh, Worth Keeter talked about how he did every single job on a film set while he worked at EO Studios, except working in wardrobe. So he said he pretty much did it all. So Earl, I think there were two schools of thought there. There were the ones that uh, that needed experience, that needed the opportunity that Earl could help kind of cultivate and give that chance to find that talent within them. That was, that was one. But the other was looking at those that maybe uh, society or uh, arts and entertainers had kind of forgotten and kind of pushed aside for whatever reason. You talked about Brother Dave Gardner. That's one of them. We talked about Roy Orbison at that time. Also, there were a lot of Western film stars that Earl was really drawn to that he would, uh, that would he give opportunities. And if you look at Buckstone County Prison, uh, you'll, you'll recognize some of those faces from legendary Westerns. And uh, I just love that about Earl. And Earl uh, would always say, you know, some of these were, were, the idols that I had from an arts and entertainment standpoint, they were the ones that I, that I would adore, uh, either listening to their music um, or listening to them make me laugh or watching them on screen. And uh, I don't want anybody to be forgotten. And so in that, he would give them uh, a chance to shine once more. And I always appreciated that about Earl. From those two standpoints, those who had, who had risen to the top, and those that were kind of on their way up to finding their place. And, and that's something that he did uh, throughout his career. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all a good point. I know Don Red Berry was one of the uh, actors that appeared in, I believe he was in Buckstone County Prison, yes. I want to say. So, yeah. Well, uh, you know, we I don't want to keep you too long. I know, uh, you know, um, but there are a few things I just wanted to mention. Um, you know, as he ramped down production in the late 80s, he became involved with James Cameron, and so we, we would be remiss if we didn't tell that story uh, for anybody who doesn't know uh, his connection to James Cameron and the 1989 film The Abyss. Yeah, Earl and James Cameron became friends uh, when Cameron was first working on The Terminator, the original Terminator, and they became friends, and uh, Cameron was talking to Earl about possibly shooting that film uh, here. Uh, that didn't uh, didn't happen at that time, but at that time, uh, some interesting tidbits. The uh, the Terminator was going to be cast uh, at, back before it actually ended up being shot. The original cast had Powers Booth as the Terminator and Christopher Reeve as uh, the you know the, the Connor who comes back you know from the future um, to kind of help uh, stop this. Those were the original cast members. You know, that didn't work out at that time. It was eventually shot, of course, and, and, and you know, became a success and you know, really took Schwarzenegger to another level and, and Cameron, I think, as well. But that friendship kind of developed and continued. And then uh, when Earl purchased an abandoned nuclear power plant uh, in the late 80s uh, in Gaffney, South Carolina, Duke had abandoned this power plant called the Cherokee Power Plant. Earl bought it, was going to turn it into several things, uh, ultimately had an idea for uh, an amusement park, studio. Uh, Cameron got wind of it, and Cameron at that time was wanting to do the abyss and wanting to shoot some real underwater stuff. And so 
came to Gaffney, South Carolina, scouted the location, and there's some great uh, documentaries if you want to look at kind of the making of the abyss and you get a chance to just to see just uh, it's amazing so many it's amazing people didn't die on that project but but Fox came uh, and uh, and they said yeah we want to we want to lease this facility from you Earl and do this and so they did they ended up shooting the abyss uh, you know, the abyss was when it was released uh, did, did not find success at the box office like they had hoped. A part of that, I think a big part of that is because Cameron didn't have the uh, opportunity to edit it like he wanted to. And if you look at the special edition, it's such a, you, you see a much clearer picture of what that film was supposed to be. There were a lot of uh, issues and challenges that happened with that uh, film, not just from a filmmaking standpoint, but also uh, with Earl and 20th Century Fox. There was a, a battle that happened because Earl was not getting paid his money. And uh, you know, he, he was you know, one of the first to tell you, he said, I didn't have any problem with, with Cameron or, or Gail and Heard. It was with 20th Century Fox. And so there was kind of this in-between going on. And so Earl had to end up taking Fox uh, to court uh, to, to ultimately find a way to get his money back. And um, you know, that was the, I think, you know, Earl will tell you, that was the time he realized, you know, I don't really want to be playing with the big boys. I, I enjoyed it much better. Uh, when I was able to, to do it and, and call the shots uh, on my own. And, uh, yeah, The Abyss was was that last project that put a lot of stress on, on Earl and EO Studios for sure. Yeah, it put him in a precarious financial position too, uh, if memory serves me correctly, because I think that he, because of the, legal, the mounting legal bills and all that, he had to, I think he had to sell some, some stuff there was some financial stuff difficulty that he and i'm not sure how he met those challenges but i know that there was uh, uh some problems due to his you know having to fight that in court and i'm, I'm sure that, that it wasn't cheap so yeah yeah he found a way to get on the other side of it and uh you know that particular facility uh was not just used for the abyss but it was also used for a couple of other projects uh, florida straits with raul julia uh, it was utilized for that, and then there was a uh, series, I think, with Parker Stevenson called uh, Probe, uh, or it was a, a pilot for a series, and uh, that was that was also shot there. And um, with with all of these projects, uh, alums from EO Studios ended up working on on those projects as well. Yeah, that's uh, th th yeah, I'm I'm glad that he was able to to meet the financial obligations that he had because, like I said, when you're you're when you're fighting a, a behemoth as 20th Century Fox was, it's it's kind of like a, a Davy and Goliath <laughs> situation. That's pretty uh, much Earl's whole mentality is a yeah. David versus a Goliath. I mean, you know, one thing we we um, you know, we talked about some of the films like Chain Gang and, and Rottweiler, but something we didn't mention is during that time these films were also shot in 3D. Yeah. So Earl was was the the first to bring 3D back during this kind of the craze that happened in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, and he did several films in 3D. And the whole story of shooting uh, these projects in 3D is something fascinating as well because uh, the, the challenges, the technical challenges with doing 3D filmmaking uh, is is monumental, especially during that time. And the the stories behind that are just fascinating to me still and uh, I was talking to Worth Keeter I mentioned earlier uh, as the director for a lot of Earl's films he said they had to create uh, create ways of shooting and create uh, technically things to do with with cameras and lighting because they didn't nobody had kind of the blueprint because it was it was such a new uh, or a new renewed phenomenon again to do 3D again. Yeah, that, I, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I, I'm sure because, yeah, there was this, uh, you know, 3D had been dormant for decades, and then suddenly in the early 80s we had this resurgence where you had Friday the 13th Part 3 and Amityville 3D and Jaws 3D, and so there was a whole uh, slew. And so, yeah, I, again, he was able to find a trend and, and, and find his place to uh, to capitalize on that in a good way. So, yeah, uh, that that is that is quite interesting, and so... Yeah, he, he did pretty good for a guy who built a movie studio in a cow pasture, as it were. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly really right, man. You're exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And the studio still stands. We'll tell people uh, that it's still there. It's uh, You can actually see it if you 
Uh, you can do your little Google Map thingy or whatever and find it anytime if you're in the area and, and drive past it. All the sound stages still remain. I don't know if the, I don't think there's any production going on at this point, just kind of sitting there. But uh, it is there for all yeah. in all its glory. I, I think it would have been incredibly amazing, Adam, to have been a part of those early days of that studio in, in full operation uh, you know back in the the mid 70s early 80s when there was there was constant production going on uh, you know you talk to those who who came through and who are alums of the Earl Owensby School of filmmaking and they'll tell you uh, it was a community uh, it was an opportunity and and for many of those they will say you, they would not be where they are now were it not for Earl allowing them to take a chance on themselves and for him taking a chance with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I think forever indebted to what Earl uh, did for independent filmmaking in North Carolina, proving that you could do it, uh, proving that you don't have to be in the Hollywood mainstream in order to create a story, put it on film and find a way for an audience to see it. Uh, and you shoot it in uh, Shelby, North Carolina and the surrounding area and you get it into places like you know, Germany and, uh, and, and England. Of course, in England, it's going to be the same, but the foreign language market just really kind of blows me away of what, how Earl was able to find that and then capitalize on that. And he, you know, he would tell you that after he discovered that overseas market and he discovered the money he was able to get on that, he said, I don't care if it's shown in North Carolina or South Carolina or Georgia. <laughs> you know, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where else are you going to see a film that has a chase taking place on Highway 74 in rural North Carolina? So, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and sometimes like a 28-minute chase, you know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, that was the first thing that I noticed when I saw Challenge, I said. Oh, that's Highway 74. It's just right up the road from where I <laughs> 30 minutes up the road. I know exactly that's it. what that's at. That's, that's it. That's too funny. Well, we'll talk very quickly about what Earl has been up to in the intervening years since he left film production, and you can tell us a little bit about it. I know he had a, an unfortunate accident where he had a, a really nasty fall from a ladder that uh, set him back a little bit, but thankfully he recovered from that, uh, and uh, he's still among us, thankfully, thankfully, but we'll talk about a little bit about what he's been up to. Yeah, about 20 years ago, Earl had a had a nasty fall, and at that time, Earl and I were doing, uh, we did were doing both a TV and a radio show on movies, uh, and and it was called Cinema Scene, uh, and then I, I had Earl on, and we would we would banter uh, about film. It was great to be able to have him being involved uh, in that, and we did that for for a few years together. He had a fall um, when he came back, you know, from that, and 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 I'm talking, he was on a roof, uh, doing some work on a roof, fell. Uh, went into a coma, uh, and, and many people, uh, the doctors said, you know, if he comes back, uh, you know, we don't know what that's going to be like if he comes back. He, he may not have any memory. Uh, we're not sure what his uh, mental capacity may be. We, we just don't know. And so there was a real fear uh, of what would, what would unfold with that. But Earl did come back and, um, you know, tried to uh, escape the hospital when they, you know, he was, he was, ripping tubes out and he was ready to get out of there and, and they're like no no you got to stay in here you got to stay in here for a while till we get you get you settled but um he actually tried to um work it out with another patient so they could kind of uh you know get out of there together uh, but, but that's a whole other funny story too but uh but earl did come back from that and uh, you know over the years uh he's continued to kind of work behind the scenes he's uh you know worked on his projects getting them uh, digitized and uh, trying to get them out there and available on, on, on DVD and, as you said, uh, some Blu-rays and um, you know, trying to keep his work alive in, in some form uh, or fashion. And uh, you know, while uh, it, it's not easy to find all of his films, uh, he has uh, worked hard to try to keep, keep them alive in some way or another. And, and that's something that I, I want to try to do uh, my part in that because I, I know the value the historical value of what he um, has meant uh, to the state and to, to filmmaking um, during uh, an incredible time, but it's, it's, it was a foundational time. And 
uh, I want more and more people to know the name Earl Owensby and, and know the impact that he had. So anything I can do to share that, I'm definitely going to do that. Um, uh, Earl is, uh, as a, of the recording of this, uh, 88 years old. And uh, like you said, he's still, he's still around. He's still around. And I'm just uh, happy to call him friend. Yes, we're grateful that he's still around. A absolutely. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, and, and he's, he's beat the odds so many times. So, you know. Now, he was teaching a while for a, a course over at, uh, was it Gardner-Webb where he was teaching a course on film, I think, for a while? So he did do that, I know, for, for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, I had actually one of the first courses I taught at Gardner-Webb uh, mm -hmm. was the films of Earl Owensby. <laughs> and um, he was uh, I, he was there every single week with me, so it was almost like getting the live uh, you know commentary for films with Earl being there. We would we would do the Q and A, setting things up before uh, we'd have a film every single week. So we do a Q and A before, and then we would do follow up Q and A afterwards. And Earl was there to just give some in incredible insight and behind the scenes uh, aspects about uh, the making of each of these films and and what what uh what we went through and so that was a blast uh i you know when i look back at uh, the opportunities i had to do some teaching that was one that i will definitely never uh forget and and i remember students going how often do you get a chance to go to a a class where you're studying the films of a certain filmmaker and that filmmaker is there every single week <laughs> yeah right that's amazing that really and, is. and duke, duke university also had um uh, a um uh, a course on the films of earl owens B. Uh, back probably in the uh, the early 90s, um, uh, there was a professor who, who did that at, at Duke University as well. Oh, very good. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. That's, that's good to know. Well, this has been great talking about Earl. We wanted to uh, celebrate the his 50th anniversary in, uh, you know, starting the Earl Owensby Studios, as it were, with the production of Challenge. And so I thought this was a fitting time to talk about him and the contributions he's made to film and North Carolina film industry, as you mentioned earlier, and there's no better person to talk about him and his career than you, my friend. <laughs> well, I, I will I will argue with that. There are a lot more people that could talk and, and, and give you some much better insight. I'm just happy that you, you chose me, uh, and, and I would like to just say from a standpoint of, it, from Earl, if you ever get a chance or ever had a chance to meet him, uh, it, it is his charisma, his energy, his positive outlook, and his uh, never say never attitude that I think continued to push him through those obstacles and those hurdles and those David versus Goliath moments. Uh, if you said, no, Earl, you can't do it. He said, watch, watch, watch me. And I love that about <laughs> his personality and that just capacity to say, you just Give me a chance. You'll, you'll see. Yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. The tenacity of a cockroach, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Good for him. We could all take a, a lesson or two from, from that uh, outlook on life. Well, this has been great. Thank you for coming on this episode of Adam's Corner. It's, it's a joy, and, and uh, we just I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, man. Enjoyed it as well. Appreciate it so much. Okay. All right, let me hit...